Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for another webinar. Uh, today, we're going to talk pumps and pump systems. And we're going to talk a lot about uh, basic repair and maintenance of those pump systems. But first, a, a few housekeeping items. Um, some of the things we're going to talk about uh, today, I'm sure you're going to have questions. And one of those questions that we always get is uh, whether or not we can get a copy of the presentation. And the answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, after the presentation, you're going to get um, some follow-up uh, follow emails. Please just respond to those emails. Those come straight to me, and I will uh, uh, get you a copy of uh, the presentation if you need to have it. We'll also have a recording of this up on our YouTube page and up on our website, so if you would like that, I'm happy to get that for you as well. So please don't hesitate uh, to request that. Also, at the end of the program, we're going to have a time for some questions and answers. So if you have those pump questions, uh, just put them in the little Q&A box that are down there at the bottom of your screen, and uh, we'll get those questions asked uh, and answered for you. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Wade Heisler. He's a TPC instructor here, um, and he's going to talk all about, all about pumps. So Wade, take it away. Okay, thanks, John. I appreciate it. Good morning, everybody. Um, like John said, my name's Wade Heisler. I'm a I'm a mechanical instructor for TPC training, um, and I spend a lot of time uh, looking at other people's pumps and pump systems, and it's kind of a fascinating journey because um, I go all the way from waste treatment to water treatment to chemical plants to uh, refineries and stuff like that, and um, I, I, I see a lot of people scratching their heads every day, so um, hopefully this... Uh, little short webinar will give you some kind of an idea of what we're capable of doing when we come to your facility in an on-site and or in an open seminar class. So, um, stand by a second here. Here we go. So, TPC is a training leader of online instructor-led maintenance training. Not only do we do um, open seminars where we hold them in hotels around the play, around the countryside. Um, we also do uh, training in, in, on your, at your site, at your location. Um, in the maintenance side, we do a lot of hands-on if, if we have the opportunity to look at your equipment. Um, and in the open seminars, we sometimes do what we call a simulcast where if you have somebody that you want to have a little, perhaps a refresher or, or anything like that, um, we can do a, a, a simulcast where we can bring you into it and the individual that you'd like to have the training done to can actually sit there and watch what's going on on a, key, on a computer screen in your office or even at their own home. So um, we have a lot of classes, like I said, but on the me mechanical side, um, we start out with Usually some little bit of housekeeping as far as when we talk about who's qualified um, and uh, a lot about uh, demonstrated skills, um, knowledge and how to find the information. Um, and most importantly to me, I think probably the, the, a lot of time is in the beginning of these classes that we do are spent on understanding safety and understanding you know, things uh, you should do. Um, one of the things that I like to bring up to people is, as I always tell people, is years ago there was uh, the old railroad crossings, um, the old crossbars before they had the, the lights on them and stuff like that. They used to have that sign, and the sign always said, stop, look, and listen. And um, basically um, what we try to do and try to convey to people is, is the skills to stop, look, listen, what's going on. Um, avoiding hazards, understanding um, what could happen if I did that. And I always tell people, it's, you stand there for a few seconds and just kind of look at the machine and then ask yourself a few questions. What's it doing? Um, what's the operator complaining about? All those kind of things. And I always tell people to hesitate slightly because it's, it's better to hesitate and, and make, a, make an intelligent move than to jump in and start tearing things apart only to find out that really wasn't what was going on. So we like to point out a qualified person has demonstrated skills to be able to perform the tasks at hand, um, the knowledge to understand where to find that information, and 
obviously the safety training involves so the individual can go home in one piece at night and uh, it doesn't end up uh, hurting himself or hurting others. So when we talk about that, and part of the demonstrated skills, OSHA's definition for a qualified person, and um, you can look this up if you like, includes the phrase, has demonstrated skills. So this typically requires that a person can actually demonstrate the ability to perform the task. Um, does he have the appropriate PPE? Does he use the appropriate PPE? Um, does he follow lockout tagout procedures as defined by your company policies? Um, you know, what is the responsibility of the individual as he's doing it? Is he locking out and tagging out um, the mechanical side of the machine? Is he also having, if he's not qualified as an electrician, is the qualified electrician there to properly lock out and tag out electrically that device? Is the information conveyed to the operations group that that machine's going to be down for a little while because we're going to be working on it? Um, is this a, is this a, an incident where the machine has failed or is this a preventative maintenance incident? You know, those types of scenarios all have to be approached before anyone starts to do any work. So I'm always a proponent of the lockout, tag out, make sure you know where your energy sources are. Make sure, especially if you're working on a pump, what is the fluid that you're pumping? Um, is it a chemical? Is it hazardous? If it leaks out, can it cause a problem? Um, all those kind of scenarios. Is it poisonous? Do I have the proper um, information I need to um, address those types of situations? So um, a, lot is, a lot of housekeeping is done at first when we do these kind of classes to talk about exactly what it is um, you need to be sure of so that you can actually uh, not cause a problem, but repair a problem. So jumping into the pump side of the world, um, everybody says, you know, a pump is a pump is a pump. Well, pumps are typically specified for what they're trying to do. Now, that being said, um, the pump on the far left-hand side, the big white one that you see on your screen, um, that's what I call an intake pump. That's actually on a waste system, a sewage treatment plant. And um, had I had the wherewithal about me, I'd have had somebody stand next to it. But basically, the center line of that pump was probably about six foot tall. So that's a pretty good sized pump. Um, interestingly, that pump was installed years ago and functions quite nicely. About the only thing they've ever had to do to was update the seal and it's designed and it was put into service in the 60s. Um, the next little pump that you see there um, is what we call a jockey pump for a fire system. So now we've got uh, a jockey pump for a fire system and a waste treatment pump. What's the difference? Um, not a whole lot mechanically because basically my pump is basically the sum of all of its parts. It's got an electric motor, a gearbox, whatever that's driving that thing. There's bearings that are involved, there's shafting involved. But they are all quite different for what they do. Now, people always ask the question, um, when I look at my pump, how do I know it's doing what it's doing? Well, in the, in the picture in the, that says Aurora pump there, um, that's basically some of the information that we try to explain to people and it tells me where's my pump operating at and what's it doing. Um, other important information is the, the model number, the serial number, um, the gallons per minute and feet of head. Um, those are all very important when you're doing a troubleshooting task. Uh, and then in all fairness, that's exactly the, the thing that needs to be kept complete, intact, and don't let the paint ninjas go crazy and paint over the tag because that makes it kind of difficult to get the information to repair the pump when you need to get to that point. Now, I'm sure everybody's seen one of these. If they don't have one at their facility, they probably run across them. The one on the far right-hand side is what we call a typical fire pump. Um, it's, a, it's what we call a split case pump. Um, it's, the very, it's the very basics of pumps. Um, that's a pump that you want it to work when you need it. Otherwise, it just kind of sits there and it becomes a maintenance item because somebody walks in and says, hey, you know, this fire pump is spewing water all over the place. And 
you know, I got to call the fire guy because nobody else is allowed to work on it. So those kind of scenarios you, you look at and you say, so what's the pump doing? Is it moving waste? Is it moving clean water? Is it moving uh, non-potable water? Is it moving a chemical? Um, basically, any one of these three pumps that you see in the picture could probably do all of the above. So um, as this goes on, bear with me here a second. Um, when I tell people uh, they've got to go look at a pump, the first thing I ask them to think about before they jump into it and roll their sleeves up and just start tearing everything apart is, what is the pump not doing? What is the pump doing? What's the pressure? What's the discharge pressure on the pump? Is the pump running at all? I mean, is it making noise while it's running or is it just sitting there buzzing and humming? Um, then the other question you need to know before you can calculate and do all the pressure calculations there is, is what is the pump pumping? Because pumps are what we call constant head devices. So therefore, <clears throat> excuse me, as a constant head device, this pump is gonna move fluid so high, so far, so fast. And what's interesting about it is, is I could have a pump that generates 100 feet of head. And in pumping water, at 100 feet of head, the discharge pressure would be about 43 PSI. If I was pumping salt water, salt water is slightly heavier than water, so that would be about 57 PSI. And if I was pumping gasoline, everyone knows that petroleum products are typically lighter than water because when you mix them together, the water falls to the bottom. Um, that pressure gauge would read 34 PSI. And people would tend to scratch their heads and say, okay, why has this pump got different pressures in it if I'm pumping different products? Well, the answer to that is your specific gravity. So one of the things that I always tell people is, is the first thing you gotta do is get a good pressure gauge at the inlet of your pump and at the discharge of your pump, and that'll kind of give you some kind of an idea what the pump is really doing. Um, most people say, well, I can't tell what my pump is doing because I don't have a flow meter. A flow meter is a secondary item in troubleshooting in the pump world. Um, in a lot of processes, chemical processes, flow meters are very important. But typically most um, facilities where we're just pumping things from here to there, um, maybe it's a process and I'm not really um, trying to understand how many gallons per minute I'm flowing. I'm just moving from one place to another. Um, most maintenance facilities don't carry flow meters. Now those are available to be um, rented from different companies. There are companies out there that specifically rent those things. But I tell people you don't really need a flow meter because if the pressure that's coming out of the pump meets the head spec, in other words, if I take that 100 feet of head and I divide it by 2.31, I get that 43 PSI, 43 point whatever. And I always tell people, uh, don't be too concerned if the pressure is not exactly, um, because when we talk a little bit later on here about um, curves of a pump, um, a pump can operate to the right or the left of the curve, but it can only operate so far to the right or the left of the curve. Once I get to a certain point, I start creating stresses on the machine that will cause premature failure of some components. So I always ask the question, what's the pump not doing? What's the pump doing? What's the pressure? Is the pump running? Is it making a noise? Is it vibrating? All those kind of things. So it, that goes back to the basics of troubleshooting, so that stop, look, and listen scenario. So I always tell people um, I've got bad habits, and some of my bad habits are I like to touch things. Well, touching's fine, but one has to understand before they try to touch something, um, am I going to become involved in this machine? Is it going to grab a hold of me and pull me? Is it hot? All those kind of scenarios. But, you know, if you walk up to a piece of equipment that's running and you touch some of the non-moving parts, you want to be sure that it's not hot, those kind of scenarios. But typically, if you can feel vibrations coming from this machine that are somewhat excessive, um, you've probably got some kind of a problem going on. Unless that machine is designed to vibrate for that reason, you know, maybe it's sitting next to a shaker or something like that, some kind of a conveyor system with an eccentric in it, stuff like that. 
So it, it all basically has to do with the basics of troubleshooting, the who, what, why, where, and hows of troubleshooting. So when we talk about a, a pump there, and I got this beautiful picture of this end suction centrifugal pump. Um, kind of the interesting part about this pump is, as I tell people, um, when we're doing the basics, as an end suction centrifugal pump, this is what we call an overhung impeller. So basically the impeller is just kind of dangling out there on the end of the shaft and everything's being held in place by those two bearings from what we call the dry side of the pump. Um, when a pump operates, it typically performs two functions. Uh, the centrifugal action creates an area of pressure less than atmospheric at the inlet of the pump, which allows the atmospheric pressure that's on us every day to push that liquid from the reservoir to the inlet of the pump. So we call that the suction side of the pump. Second, its centrifugal action delivers the pump to the volute, and the volute is the, volute is the casing or the body that's around the impeller, and that typically um, is gonna generate a flow. And the one thing I always tell people is, is pumps produce flow. It does not generate the pressure. It produces the flow necessary for development of the pressure, which is a function of the resistance to flow in the system. Going back to some of the basic hydraulics in the world, we talk about several different people out there. Bernoulli, as a matter of fact, that we go over Bernoulli's principle. He's the reason why curveballs curve and airplanes fly. But Bernoulli basically came up with the theory, if I squeeze a fluid down through a, a restricted orifice, um, the velocity of the fluid increases and the pressure decreases. And then once I come out of that squeezed off section and I go back to a larger section of pipe, the, the flow slows down, but the pressure increases. So Bernoulli is one of the guys that I like to talk about. The other guy I like to talk about is Blaise Pascal. And Pascal's theory is, is if I apply pressure to an, a liquid in an enclosed device, in, in an enclosure, pressure acts equally and undiminished in all directions. So when we talk about a hydraulics of a pump, centrifugal pumps are typically non-positive displacement. So saying that, it means typically that what goes into that pump might not come out of that pump. Um, on the other hand, when we talk about pumps around our facility, we might have some positive displacement pumps. In other words, if you're in the, uh, uh, perhaps the food processing industry, they use load pumps and screw pumps. Um, those are typically positive displacements. So what goes into those pumps must come out of those pumps. So they'll have pressure relieving devices and pressure control devices to keep that pump from uh, reaching a point where the pressure inside becomes enough that it will uh, fracture or break the machine. So typically in the centrifugal side, that's not an issue. But if you get to a certain point where you're not flowing as much fluid as it's designed or you're flowing more fluid than it's designed, then that's when you start picking up um, vibrations that tend to cause um, seal failure and bearing failure and liquid leakage out of the pump. So that's kind of like the basics of it. So I always tell people pumps don't really care what they're pumping. Uh, provided it's fluid, it doesn't have any air in it. And in some pumps like this one in particular, it typically can only handle about 10% solids. And um, the solids at this particular style of pump that you're looking at has to be somewhat non-fibrous or stringy because it tends to plug up the impeller. So that's another thing when you get into the design of the pump. What is it you're pumping? So that's part of the, the questions that are asked. Okay, so when we talk about pressure, like I said before, that's Pascal's law, force exerted on the walls of the container. And when I get people that kind of look at me saying, okay, so what really is pressure? Well, pressure is if I was to take a, a Coke can that was not opened, let's say, and everybody knows that if you had a six pack of Coke sitting on the floor and the cans weren't open, you can kind of use them for a little step stool, even though it's not safe, but it actually holds the weight up because the container is capable of keeping the liquid inside of it 
the, the force that's being pushed down on that can acts equally and undiminished in all directions and it helps hold you up. Now, on the other hand, if that can was empty and you stood on it, it had air in it. And if you stepped on an empty can, you typically end up squashing the can because you can compress an air. You can compress a, a, a gas. So going along from there, uh, they talk about flow rate. Now, a lot of people get hung up on flow rates of pumps. And in most instances, like I said before, we, we typically don't have flow meters involved in the pumping system unless it's something where I have to I have to uh, be able to report custody or, or perhaps billing purposes and things like that. So I always tell people when they're looking at these pumps, if the pressure on the discharge side calculates out to the head value, then you have to assume that the pump is doing what it's supposed to be doing. And the catch on that is, is I try to get people to understand that the inlet pressure also makes a difference. So pumps are basically, like I said before, a head device. So if I had a, a pump that was pumping, say, 90 PSI, and I do the calculation, and it says, according to what I calculated, that pressure gauge should be 70 PSI. So if you subtract 70 from, a, from 100, you realize that the inlet pressure on the side of that, on the, the inlet of that pump should be about 30 PSI. So that's kind of the scenario where, okay, the pump's doing what it's supposed to be doing. So as we go along, we talk about heads measured in work as, as expressed in feet. And it all is based on um, a calculation that at standard atmosphere, a cubic foot of water that's 12 by 12 by 12 weighs approximately 62.3 pounds. And going back to the basic math in the world, we talk about um, there's 144 cubic inches in a cubic foot. So if you divide that 62.3 pounds by 144, you come up with 0 0.432 pounds. And in order to make that one pound of pressure, I have to take and stack two of those columns that are one by one by 12 on top of one another, and I do 0 0.31 of another one to make one pound of pressure. So that's why we talk about pumps or head devices. Um, the only time that doesn't come into play is when you're looking at a fire pump, because a fire pump is rated in gallons per minute and pounds per square inch of discharge pressure, um, because that's what that pump is designed to do. So. In the everyday industry, pumps are basically, you're not going to see a pressure discharge number on it. You're going to see it so many gallons per minute and so many feet ahead. So as that goes on, and we talk about the density. Now, density is another thing. Um, and yeah, I kind of relate to it like this. Everybody knows that if you throw a cork into a bucket full of water, it's going to float to the top because it's less dense than the water. Um, if we throw a stone in that same bucket, the stone sinks to the bottom because the stone has got a higher density to it. And they talk about volume, and it's usually expressed as in pounds per gallon. So um, everybody knows the weight of a gallon of water, but um, a gallon of gasoline is actually weighs much less. So, and then I, I go into that specific gravity scenario, and everybody's like, oh my gosh, what do you do? Well, I talked, I talked about the minimums and the maximums there. And I always had this lovely question I throw out there. It's how much does, how much does uh, mercury weigh? Well, everybody knows nowadays mercury is one of those hazardous things. But back in the day when I was a little bit younger, <laughs> we used to play with it in science class. And it was kind of funny because now if you spill a, a spoonful of mercury on the ground, you typically got to call the fire department to clean it up because it becomes a hazardous waste scenario. So, but mercury is the heaviest known liquid to man. It has a specific gravity of 13.44. And um, to go back against that, a cubic foot of mercury weighs 845 pounds, where a cubic foot of water weighs 62.3. So keeping that in mind, specific gravity is the ratio of the density of that fluid. Not the viscosity, but the density. Um, because petroleum products can have a high viscosity, but their density is less 
than water. So pressure exerted on the walls of a pump is measured in pounds per square inch. Now, that being said, everybody kind of understands pounds per square inch. One of the things that's coming, well, I shouldn't say coming, one of the things that are out there is the fact that a lot of equipment is used in different parts of the world. So sometimes you're liable to see pounds per square inch and you're liable to see the um, dimension of what we call a bar. And where I go with that is, is we, we talk about standard atmosphere is 14.7 pounds per square inch absolute. So I know it's kind of an interesting scenario, but everybody says, okay, well, if I pull a gauge out of my box and look at it, it says zero. What's that? Well, that's gauge pressure. It's 14.7 pounds per square inch absolute. So this is when we start talking about pressure. Anything beyond that 14.7 is considered pounds per square inch gauge. Um, at that point, when we convert gauge to bar, um, one bar is actually 14 and a half pounds per square inch. They rounded it because it makes it easier to look at. So that's that when we talk about pressure. Now, we all ask what's the pressure of air at sea level? There we go, 14.7 PSI, A, that's absolute. What causes that pressure to change? Weather, altitude, and vacuum. Um, I've run across pump applications where um, it was on a portable piece of equipment. And this particular piece of equipment was working to supply water to a restroom facility at the top of a mountain at a ski hill. And what was kind of interesting is, is they put this thing together down at the bottom of the mountain and it pumped the water just fine. But when they took it to the top of the mountain, it didn't do that. And try to explain elevation to somebody, you know, the, the amount of elevation change caused the pump to cavitate. So that's another open subject. Um, that's one of my fun questions that I ask when I'm doing this training. I always ask people, do you know what cavitation is? And nine times out of 10, um, the students in the class will typically answer, well, it's air. Well, that's not totally true. What it is is it's steam. And um, it's caused by the water boiling because I pulled too much vacuum against that liquid. So when we talk about head, head's a measure of pressure as expressed in feet. Now here's that, what I explained to you a little bit before. Um, a cubic foot of water contains 4.7, I'm sorry, 7.48 gallons of water weighing in at 62.3 pounds. If I do that math, I get 0.432 pounds. So if I want to look to see exactly what the dimension of a pound of water is, it's actually two of those columns with 0.31 put up on top of it. Now, one of the things I like to see when I see pump systems is the top gauge would be what we call a suction pressure gauge. That's where we would put it on the, on the inlet of the pump. Um, if you had inlet pressure higher than about 25 or 20 PSI, on a continuous basis, then you would want to use obviously a positive gauge. Um, if you were drawing fluid up from an open vessel, that's where you would look at a suction gauge. Um, so there's, you know, it's just preference. And one of the things I, I tell people when they're out there trying to troubleshoot a pump, and a lot of people throw back at me and say, yeah, you know, I don't have a pressure gauge. I don't have a pressure gauge. Well, you know, that's one of those tools that needs to be uh, kept in a place that's uh, reliable so that you get good, good, reliable readings all the time. Now, there's several different ways to permanently install pressure gauges on pumping systems. But I always tell the maintenance people, if you're working on a pump, make sure you've got a good pressure gauge capable of using so that you can actually read exactly what the pump is doing. Because... In a lot of applications, I see customers will put pressure gauges in systems and they'll constantly be operating against the pressure. And over a period of time, the gauge will tend to mechanically come out of, uh, come out of set. So, so if I was to tell you um, how do I find the pressure on this thing, I take this data plate here 
and we're looking at this flow serve pump. And um, the interesting part is, is some pump manufacturers will actually put a lot of information on this. Um, information is good. Um, this information needs to be kept someplace where you can find it and identify it and where the maintenance people can get at it. Now, if you look at this, you take the data plate and you take that head pressure, which has got the little arrow pointing at it, it says 184 feet ahead. It says 184.7. So you could either go 184 or 185. I don't get too crazy about it because if the pump is doing what you see in the calculation up here, 184 divided by 2.31 equals 79.65 PSI. So if your gauge is reading um, 77, 76, 80, 81, 82, 83, um, the pump is then running typically where it belongs on the curve. But now if I go to this pump and I'm having problems with pump seals and I see that my pressure is quite low, um, let's say my pressure is down around the 40, 50 PSI range. Now a couple things come into play. The pump is actually trying to move more fluid than is possible, and it can actually start to create vibrations that'll cause seal failure and bearing failure. So I always tell people it's always a good idea to understand um, if I got PSI, I'm gonna multiply by 2.31, to see what my feet ahead is. If I got head, I'm gonna divide it by 2.31. And you also have to take into consideration specific gravity. Now, the interesting part about this pump tag is it says reformate splitter reflux. Um, the question I would ask somebody is, is okay, what's reformate? Um, is it some type of a mixed material? Um, if it is a type of a mixed material, what's its specific gravity? Because that would actually affect the calculation. As you can see there, you take the head and divide it by 2.31, but you divide it by specific gravity as well. So, and everything in the pump world is based on water. Water has a specific gravity in the pump world of one. So, typically in a water application, you don't even get too crazy about specific gravity. The only time that would come into play is if you were pumping salt water. So one of the proverbial questions I get in, this, in the winter time and in the springtime is, is my chiller system has, has water in it and I put glycol in it to keep it from freezing in the winter time. Does that change the specific gravity? Now the answer to that is, is glycol is typically lighter than water. It's actually, solvent and or can be hydrated by the water so it actually takes on the specific gravity of the water so and they talk about the flow rate where we talk about the volume of fluid which passes from a point um, most of the times um, if the if the discharge pressure uh, minus the suction pressure matches the head on the tag on the pump you have to assume that the pump is actually doing what it's supposed to be doing. If I've lost flow, that's going to affect my head. So your pressure is going to be less. Um, like I say, a centrifugal pump's kind of a wonderful little thing. Um, I relate to it as, you know, when I was a youngster, uh, everybody remembers when they used to have merry-go-rounds in the playgrounds. And you'd stand in the middle and you'd be all fine and dandy. And then you started walking out towards the edge. The centrifugal force would tend to try to make you fly off that um, merry-go-round. So on every single pump, you're going to get flow rate and pump head. Those are the two most important specifications. Okay, Those are the things that will tell you what that pump's supposed to be doing. So, in this particular picture, what we've got here is it, so is your pump working? That's a good question. If the answer is yes, that's great. If the answer is no, it's like, uh oh, now what do I do? Is it time to panic? Well, no, not totally, because it's time to find the pump curve. Um, if you can't find the pump tag, you can find the pump curve. Um, that'll tell you the same thing that's on the tag. Now, in this particular picture here, this is 
typically what we would call a standard um, multiple cut pump curve. Um, what it's showing me is it's showing me the minimum size impeller that can be put into this casing, and it's showing me the maximum size of the impeller I can put in this casing. Um, the engineer that designed this particular application was looking for 800 gallons per minute at 120 feet ahead. So if I did that calculation at 120 feet ahead, bear with me a second here. The pressure gauge coming off of that pump should read about 51 or 52 PSI. And what that's gonna tell me is that's gonna tell me that my pump is operating where it belongs. Now, if I were to come back to you and say, hmm, okay, my pump is not putting out that pressure, my pump is putting out a greater pressure. Well, if I look at that curve, and I see the fact that I can go from 120 to 160, so if you split the difference between the two, you're probably roughly about 15 more feet ahead. So that would be about 135 feet ahead. You divide that by 2.31, now my pressure gauge should read somewhere around 60 PSI. What that's gonna tell me is that there's something that's reducing the flow in the system. And once I start getting to that point where I'm all the way to the left of that curve, I don't know if you notice that, what we call the big red line, that's the point of no return. If I was to slow the fluid flow down by choking off the discharge, and I got past that 200 gallons per minute to less than 200 gallons per minute, the pump would actually physically stop moving that liquid and you then start heating it up. So those are all the kind of things I try to tell people. Now, you notice on there those green lines, um, the one where the right angle red line is sitting at is in between the 84. Well, that's what we call the sweet spot or the BEP of my pump. So when I, when I get that pressure, that 50, 51, 52 PSI, I know I'm putting out 800 gallons per minute at 120 feet ahead. That pump should not be giving me any problems. But that's one thing. Now, if I go to there and the pressure's actually lower, then I'm gonna take that red right angled curve and I'm gonna start moving it towards the 76, 72, um, 68 percentage range. When I start doing that, these are stresses that cause seal failure, bearing damage, vibration, cavitation. Um, in some applications, I've even seen it where the motor that's driving the pump doesn't have enough horsepower to handle what's going on. Um, and case in point, I had in a situation where I got called in to do a troubleshooting on a pump system. This person had said to me, they said, Oh, you got a problem with these pumps. And I said, okay, so tell me what's going on here. And he said, well, I'm on my third pump. I'm like, wow, you're on your third pump. In how long? He said, in three days. And I'm like, okay, what's going on? He says, well, it's popping the overloads on the motor. So the motor's kicking out, and then I got to come back and reset it, and it runs for about half hour, 45 minutes, and it does it again. My electrician said it's drawn too many amps. I said, okay, so tell me a little bit about what the pump's supposed to do. You know, give me the part number or something so I can get some information. Well, it comes to find out, um, this pump was supposed to generate about 40 gallons per minute at about 160 feet ahead. And so I asked the proverbial question, how long is the suction pipe? How, how long is the discharge pipe? How many valves? How many fittings? And whatnot. And with what he explained to me over the phone, he only had six foot of suction pipe and six foot of elevation difference and six foot returning back to the tank. So he didn't have anywhere near this 160, 180 feet ahead on the resistance side of the pump. So he actually pushed the pump past its horsepower limits and it was physically drawing too many amps. So, just to verify that, I told the person on the other end of the phone, I said, um, do you got a discharge valve on that thing? He goes, yeah, it's right here at the tank. I said, okay. I said, reset the overloads and start to close that discharge valve down and tell me what happens with the amperage draw. 
And so as soon as he did that, he came back to me and says, wow, that's pretty cool. I started to close the discharge valve and the amperage started slowing down. And I said, yep. I said, that's kind of what I figured. Um, you, were, you, were in run, you were in what we call runaway. So the pump was trying to move more fluid than it physically was capable of doing. And that's the one thing that people have a hard time getting their head around. So I always tell people it's kind of interesting when you look at these things from this standpoint. So, and of course, when it was all over and done with, I asked the person the question on the phone. I said, so how long did the old pump last? And he said, well, about 11 or 12 years. And I said, well, not in that application. He goes, oh, no, no, no. He says, that pump used to be about three, 400 feet away from the tank. He says, when we added on to the plant, we had three, we got three phase power close to the tank. So we moved the pump right next to the tank. So a lot of times problems will crop up on pumps that you have in a system that works for a really, really long time. And then something happens where I have to move that pump and people don't do the calculations or the friction calculations to understand the physicalities of what the pump's capable of doing. So, now, what's kind of cool about this little curve here is this is what we call the example of where you want to be. So, as you see there, I, I, I highlighted the best efficiency point of this curve with that little orange arrow. And the dotted line to the left is what we call my minimum flow limit. Then we put in this little red line here. This is what we call the reliability percentage. As long as my pump operates within that red reliability percentage mark on the curve, this is probably going to be a pump that you'll probably have to go out and look and make sure nobody's taking it because it's, not going, to, it's going to be a good performer. It's probably not going to give you a lot of problems. Um, I can't speak to it on the mechanical side, but um, physically on the pump side, if I operate this pump at this point, that's good. Now, I kind of alluded to the mechanical side. Um, when you have an end suction centrifugal pump where you have a motor, um, you have a coupling, you have a bearing assembly, and you have your pump, um, that's where problems can go astray. If you don't align your pump, even though your pump's operating at the best efficiency point, you can still have lots of problems. So. As you can see, as you go to the right, you get low bearing, low seal and bearing life. As you go to the, uh, the left, you get discharge recirculation, you get suction recirculation, you get low bearing life and low seal life. So it's kind of one of those trade-offs. But the one thing that people have a hard time getting their head around is that word cavitation. And it's interesting because uh, certain applications of pumps are somewhat designed to operate in cavitation. And that being said, there's some specifics that are looked at. And I always tell people the best example of that is take a look at a pool pump. Um, if you look at a pool pump, pool pumps are typically a plastic body pump. And plastics can actually tolerate the impact damage that cavitation um, does to the inside of a pump. So that's typically why your pool pump that you have at home for your pool is made out of plastic and then that plastic is actually called Norel. It's actually fiber filled uh, thermal plastic. So, um, so obviously if we go down that road, that other little blue line that I just promoted in there, that would be the line that your pump takes from zero RPMs to its best efficiency point. So if anything were to change in the speed of that motor, uh, maybe I had bearing drag or something like that, or um, Somebody came in and said, oh, let's put a VFD on this thing because we can save energy. And then the other guy says, well, you know, this pump's flowing too much, so we're going to slow this pump down. So typically what's going to happen if I slow this pump down with a VFD, I can actually pull this line towards that blue. It actually follow that line downwards. So there'd become a point right at the bottom where that blue line intersects with the red line. I wouldn't want to operate that pump below that speed because I'd start having some difficulties with it. So that's kind of an interesting way to look at a curve. And for those of you who are, who are kind of confused with this whole thing, I like to use this thing we call the baseball bat analogy. This came from, oh gosh, I don't even remember where the heck I found this years ago. Um, but I tell people, if you look, if you got a baseball bat in your hand and you're swinging it at the ball, um, if the pitcher throws you a pitch and you hit the ball with your hands, <laughs> it's going to hurt. 
So we say operation below that point, damage will result. And then as you go beyond the handle and you start working up the neck of the bat or that reduced area of the bat, they call the throat, um, you're going to get vibration levels that are going to be increased. You're going to have uh, efficiency losses. Uh, you're going to have higher maintenance costs. You're going to have seal problems and stuff like that. And so if I'm swinging the ball at the bat in that area, I'm typically going to end up with a foul ball or a pop-up or something like that. And as you get into that area on there, we call the allowable operating region. Now, that's kind of where the pump starts to do what it's supposed to do. And in the baseball world, that's when you start getting a base hit, a double, a triple. And then, of course, obviously, if I hit the ball in a sweet spot of the bat, it goes out of the park and we have a home run and everybody yells. Well, if I can operate my pump continuously at that sweet spot of the bat or the sweet spot of the curve, then my pump is going to be uh, what I call a, a good performer, something that will last a long time. So... That being said, of course, obviously, once you go past that sweet spot, you can start getting triples, doubles, base hits, and then off the end of the bat, you get foul balls. So there you go. Excuse me. So troubleshooting, like I tell people, is an art. You, you don't wake up some morning and somebody says you're a troubleshooter. Um, troubleshooting <clears throat> is one of those things where um, you have to ask yourself a whole bunch of questions, like the who, what, why, where, and how of pumps, you know. Um, the first part of troubleshooting is identifying if there's a problem. And identifying if there's a problem is one of those interesting things. So anyway, um, first identify is there a problem. Uh, you got to look at the system. You got to know what it is. Um, as a as a person who comes in from the outside and looks at a pumping system, I try to take a look at everything, the whole system, where it's coming from, what its supply is, what is it pumping, is it a closed loop process, is it an open loop process, what's the pump supposed to do? Um, is the pump cavitating? Cavitation takes on a form of a noise. And I like to tell people it's kind of like um, the noise of cavitation is actually depends upon the size of the pump. And that being said, you look at it and you say, okay, how big is this pump? If it's a large pump, like as in waste treatment plants, where you have six foot inlets and six foot outlets, it kind of sounds like it's trying to grind up a set of bowling balls. If it's a smaller pump, it'll sound like it might have some rocks running around on the inside of it. I actually had an HVAC guy tell me one time he took a pump apart three times because he thought he had stones in it. And every time he took it apart, he didn't find it. He didn't realize it was cavitation going on. So um, is the pump leaking? Is the bearings making noise? A bearing noise occurs in a different arena. Um, cavitation, uh, misalignment, and those kind of things occur at a certain vibration point. Bearings, you can have a perfectly low vibrating pump, but a bearing can be making a noise, so that falls into a different step. So ask yourself the question, what is the pump not doing? The second step is to try to find the current pump information. Where do I find that? Where's it at? It's on the pump tag. Um, does the equipment ID number in the facility um, send you to a page where you can find that information? How is the pump identified at your location? You use this as a starting point. The other thing I tell people when they're troubleshooting a pump is if you can get your hands around the maintenance information or the maintenance logs to see what was done to this pump last time. You might find that this pump has done this problem more than once in its life. Now all of a sudden, my pump's a troublemaker. Okay, so now what? Can you isolate the issue between mechanical or hydraulic? Well, mechanical is what the pump's telling you. Um, sound, sight, and smell. Is the pump vibrating? Um, are the bearings making a noise? These are all things that point to problems that occur on a piece of equipment. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, in this picture, we've got a couple of vibration tools um, that can be easily accessed for some money, obviously. They don't give them away. Um, as a matter of fact, the one in the upper right-hand corner is a Fluke 812. Um, that's actually a recordable meter. It act, it'll actually record and you can download it so you can keep an eye on the machine so you can do trending. 
Um, the little meter over on the left-hand side that says the TP, uh, TPA 9080 <coughs> or 9070, those are what we call point-of-use vibration tools. And what they do is, is they will focus on either the vibration in inches per second or the damage units that are being performed or done to the um, bearings. Now, the vibration of the machine is how much it's moving. That's that ISO reading that you see up there, and it says 0.73 ISO. And then down below, it says bearing damage units, or what the condition of the bearing is. The idea there is that a maintenance person can readily identify if the problem is a, a vibration or if the problem is a bearing. So these are some of the kind of things that are handy out there in the field that the technology has come down quite a bit in cost. Um, years ago, um, that machine in the middle called Vibe Expert, that little guy right there, as simple as it looks, um, that was probably at one time probably about a twenty-five or a thirty thousand dollar tool. And in some instances, that's kind of hard to justify. Now this TPI 9080, 9070 meter runs right around four to four to six hundred dollars, depending on which version you buy of that thing. Now that becomes a tool that's relatively easier for one to acquire and for one to use because it's quite simple. Um, it just gives you some baselines. It's not a definite meter for something that you would use long term for recording vibration in machines, but like I said, the technology has come down way, way uh, a lot. So um, another thing that I tell people, how often do you check the lube level, grease the bearings? Those are things that, um, believe it or not, too much grease is not, as, is, is not any better than too little grease. Um, some small pumps use bushings. Um, a good example of that is if you got circulator pumps in your facility, we used to call the old Bell and Gossett three-piece pumps. Those things have bushings in the motor and they have bushings in the pump section of the motor, or the pump section of the pump. Um, they have sleeves with oil wick lubrication. Um, your pumps have grease fittings. How much grease do I put in it? Um, is there too much grease? Is there not enough grease? Uh, that actually has become quite a science as well. And that little website you got right there that I put up there on the page is uh, www.machinerylubrication.com. And what that will do is, is that will take you to a website and you can um, look at some of the information that's there about how to lubricate things. When we look at the mechanical part of the pump, we look at how is the pump coupled to the driver? Um, is the pump close coupled? Um, a close coupled pump utilizes the bearings of the motor. Um, if it's a motor with a flexible coupling between them, we typically have a bearing assembly. So now instead of two bearings, we have four bearings. Um, has the pump and coupling been properly aligned? Uh, what kind of alignment processes do I use? Am I using a dial indicator? Uh, am I using a double dial indicator? Am I using an alignment tool? Um, a lot of this stuff, again, like I said, like the vibration, this equipment has actually come down quite significantly in costs and becomes easier to acquire. So the other thing I tell people, do we have a loose, do we have a loose mounting foot? Do we got soft foot? Are there shims missing? Um, what's vibrating on the pump mechanically. So <clears throat> another thing that can get you into trouble, and I had this conversation at a waste treatment plant uh, a couple months ago, um, are the valves in the correct position? Are they stuck? Are they broken? Um, are they partially closed? Um, has the fluid viscosity changed, the temperature, the chemical composition? Um, What's the pump doing? What does it sound like? Is it cavitating? Uh, the sound will typically tell you if it's bearings or cavitation. There's a difference between a dry bearing and a cavitating pump. Um, is there a basket strainer in the suction line? Those are always those big no-nos. People put basket strainers in systems and they don't take them out and clean them from time to time. Um, so usually that'll show up as a low pressure indication on the suction side. So there's a lot of things to think about when you start having a hydraulic issue with a pump. So, 
So now that you have some information, what do you do? Look around the pump, do you see leakage? If so, what's leaking? Is it leaking oil or is it leaking pumpage? Is the fluid dripping out of the pump or is it spraying out of the pump? Generally speaking, pumps applied in the correct application will perform a long time if they're maintained. Um, and I always tell people, don't assume that that pump was replaced is the same as the original. Follow the paper trail. Go back to the maintenance information. I've been in a lot of facilities where they had spare pumps. The problem therein lies, if a pump was cut to that application and it was taken out of service and then a pump just like it with a different cut of the impeller uh, was replaced by that pump, now you could probably have some problems coming up. You might be either pumping too much or too little. So those are all kinds of information that needs to, needs to be followed. That's why I say follow the paper trail. So. so if you haven't set up a regular maintenance program, now might be a good time to think about it. There's a lot of information on the web. Some is good, some is not so good. Do your homework. Ask a pump professional. Uh, find a reliable pump vendor that you can work with. Once you've established a maintenance program for your pump, keep it up because once you get into understanding what a pump is doing and how to maintain it, it will actually save you quite a bit of time and money in the long run. So obviously if you've got any questions, feel free to throw them out there. Um, we offer multiple instructor-led training courses, um, pumps and pumping systems. Um, that would be, that's more of a, why do I use this kind of pump for this application? Uh, one of the more popular classes that we do is pump maintenance and repair. We talk a little bit about pump curves, but we basically get into alignment, bearings, maintenance, and that kind of stuff. Um, aside from that, we also do what we call troubleshooting rotating mechanical equipment, which gets into gearboxes, drives, couplings, alignment, scenarios like that. And then, of course, on the other side, on the mechanical, we talk about understanding and troubleshooting hydraulics. So, that being said, I think this is where John comes in, and he's right. okay. Yeah. Thanks very much, Wade. All right, um, so if you do have any questions, anything you're specifically working on, maybe at a pump at your facility, please feel free, hover down below on your screen, you'll see a Q&A box there. Just enter those in, and we'll get those questions uh, answered for you. Uh, in the meantime, as we wait for those to come in, again, if you need a copy of the presentation, uh, you're gonna get a follow-up email to this webinar. Just respond back to that email and let me know if you would like a copy of the presentation, either a PDF or if you would like the link to the actual video upload, I'm glad to send that to you as well. Uh, but we can absolutely do that for you. Uh, we're still waiting for any questions to come in, Wade. Do you have any last minute bits of advice, or any kind of parting words that you wanna share before those questions come in? Well, like I said, a lot of people will take for granted that a pump when they put it into an application will work. And um, the interesting part is, is if you talk to a real true pump engineer, he'll tell you it's not as easy as you think it is. You got to know what you're doing and you got to know a lot of things. And like I said before, if you get a good pump vendor, um, one that's very reliable, one that's very informational, those are the kind of people you want to keep around you. Um, if the first thing, if the first word out of the pump vendor's mouth is, is whoa, I'll, I'll have to take a look at it and get back to you. Um, and then he waits several days and somebody else calls you and starts asking you a bunch of questions. I'd kind of question his ability. So, um, but that being said, um, this is one of those things where, um, the internet's a great information highway, but the internet also has a lot of misinformation on it as well. So just be careful when you're looking around at things because I know, uh, YouTube websites tend to, you know, if it's the manufacturer, you're in good, you're in good standing. But if it's uh, Joe and Billy Bob's uh, YouTube video presentation, I'd kind of question its quality. So, uh, Wade, what what common problems uh, that pumps have happened to them? Do you see that most people overlook because either they don't um, they don't, you know, think it's a big deal or um, you know, it's just something that they miss. Is there anything that, that sort of people just miss because they don't think it's a big deal, but it does turn out uh, to be an, a big deal? Well, that's kind of based, that, John, that's based on answering the question, you know, what, what is it are you doing with this pump? And 
you know, obviously if it's a waste treatment plant, it becomes a really big issue because um, you're not going to pick up the phone and call a radio station and tell everybody in the town to stop flushing the toilets because that's not going to happen. So when maintenance issues crop up in a system like that, there's usually some backup involved, but there's a lot of um, misinformation again when it comes to a lot of that stuff. And I see a lot of pumps that are um, they're being repaired, but they're not being fixed. Um, in other words, I get guys to tell me, oh, yeah, you know, this seal here in this pump lasts about two or three months, and then I'm replacing it again. Um, so those kind of scenarios are things that will tell you um, you might have some kind of a hydraulic issue going on or a mechanical issue because I always tell people the seal in the pump is like what we used to call the canary in the mine shaft. Uh, mm -hmm. Miners used to take that down into the shaft, into the mine shaft with them, and if the canary keeled over, and that typically meant you were in a pocket of poisonous gas and you needed to get the heck out of the mine. So I tell people the pump seal is probably the first thing you're going to notice. And it's going to be the first problem that you're going to see when a pump starts to give you issues. All right. Uh, we're waiting for a couple more questions to come in. I'll give you guys a little bit more time uh, before we sign off here. Uh, but wait, you know, tell me, what's, what's about the average lifespan of, of a pump? And, you know, is it the seal that tends to go first? Or what's sort of the, the problem area that you find in your experience? Well, the, that's a very interesting subject because um, how long should a pump last? Um, I kind of refer to it as, a, as an old-fashioned question. It depends. Um, when I say that, I, I, I'm actually being quite serious because it depends on what it's doing. Um, it depends on its installation, depends on the plumbing, depends on is there any fluid changes going on. Um, it depends on the maintenance procedures. Are we greasing it properly? Are we over-greasing it? Are we under-greasing it? Um, was, uh, was something done to the application after it was installed and it ran? And um, basically the scientific answer to how long should my pump run is based on an equation that dates back to the 30s, and it's actually the physical equation of where 10% of all bearings fail, and the remaining 90% last eight to 10 times longer. It's called the L10 equation, the L10 life of a bearing. And it's a fascinating subject because um, engineering students across the country, they always, they always get this from their engineering professor, and they say, Okay, here's Palmgren's equation. Try to tear it apart and see if you can come up with something different. And they continually try to attack this equation, and it still stands after 1930. So it's kind of an interesting scenario. Um, again, it, it depends on what the pump is subjected to and whether or not it's maintained. So those are the kind of questions. So if I take care of my pump, um, I do what the manufacturer recommends. I follow the motor manufacturer's recommendations. Those kind of scenarios, you're probably going to have a pump that works okay. Um, probably not going to give you a lot of problems. But if the problems do crop up, that's when you start asking the questions, what's going on? So, And with that in mind, are there any certain industries or pump applications that you find that tend to present more problems than others? Um, I would like to answer it kind of in a, in a statement, and, that, and that's going to say, you know, it all depends on the environment around it. Mm -hmm. I've seen pumps in food processing facilities that were terribly maintained and people didn't understand what they were supposed to do. I've seen pumps in waste treatment plants that were terribly maintained, and then all of a sudden somebody got really oh, why is this happening? And so then, then they started looking at it and they're saying, well, gee, we don't have the qualified people to work on this stuff. We assume that just because this guy's a mechanic, he understands how to maintain a pump. So there's a lot of issues. I mean, there's really nothing specific. I've been in facilities that everything was meticulously maintained and they still had some problems with some applications. So that's one of those I guess it goes back to the it depends story, John. Right. All right. Well, I think we've reached the end of our time, Wade. Um, everyone, I want to thank you very, very much for joining us. Again, uh, if you need a copy of any of the materials, please let us know. And with that, uh, we'll sign off. Take care, everyone. Okay. Have a great day, guys.